facebook.com slash remotely global slash live um, is where other people can find us who don't join us here. Um, and uh, I'll keep looking out for questions in the meantime, but let me go ahead and pause here uh, now that we're streaming and we'll set up the cameras properly. All looks good here. Ah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be in this great world of ours. I'm very grateful you've decided to join us and talk to us a little bit here today about sociocracy, uh, remote work, and distributed organizations. And actually, it's going to be a much broader topic than that, because today I'm actually joined by Monica. Oh, gosh, I didn't get the correct pronunciation in advance. I should. Megeshi? Megeshi. How close am I? Megeshi. Okay, thank you so much, Monica and, and John Buck. And they're the co-founders of Governance Alive, based in Washington, D.C. Uh, John and Monica are both sociocracy facilitators, trainers, and consultants, optimizing systems that are truly alive and drawing upon tech social technologies like Agile, Theory U, Imageo, I got to talk to you about that, uh, Myra, somatic, no. somatic education and integral <laughs> learning. So very deep set of experience around um, what I think of as humanity sciences in many way, um, but also getting deep into what we've been talking about around collaborative uh, productivity. Um, but beyond that, Monica is a certified mediator, uh, world citizen. She speaks five languages and holds an MS in conflict management, something else I definitely want to talk about because as we get into decision making, conflict often is at the heart or actually maybe not at the heart, but at the edges of present preventing our collaboration and our decision making through the conflict when we get too much of it and we don't know how to manage it. So I'm quite excited about that. And of course, you've probably seen John Buck's TEDx speech from University of Maryland. Um, he's also the author of We the People Consenting to a Deeper Democracy. Um, consent's a really important word, so pay attention to that as we go through this. Um, Bossa Nova, I'm sorry, Consenting to Deeper Democracy, Bossa Nova company-wide agility with beyond budgeting, open space, and sociocracy. Um, two topics that I'm very familiar with and really excited to talk about and learn about sociocracy some more. And you're also now working on a new book, Governance from Below, Can Children Lead the Way? Gosh, this is so much fascinating stuff. I'm almost kicking myself that I didn't know about you guys until <laughs> Jess reached out a couple of weeks ago. Thank you so much for uh, reaching out and taking the time to chat with me. And welcome to our remotely live stream series. It is a pleasure to be here with you and everybody else listening. It, absolutely. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank, thank you so much. For, um, there's so much to talk about here, and this is one of these topics where I end up getting lost in because we're having to move between, you know, that 30,000 foot view down to the interpersonal um, quite a bit through the conversation. But before we get into the actual applications of sociocracy, um, I'd just love for you to explain kind of from your point of view, um, what is sociocracy and what is its role in society? You want to take that, Monica? No, I'll, I'll let you take the lead okay. on this one. All right, so sociocracy is one of the many ocracies. It means rule by the people who have a social relationship. And that's as opposed to like democracy, which is ruled by the, not the socius, but the demos, which is a Greek word meaning the general mass of people, as opposed to an autocracy, which is the way uh, most businesses run today and uh, a few countries and the oligarchies and all sorts of stuff. Um, so it, it's very specifically about um, people who know each other ruling, governing together. So to, is this somewhat related or is it um, perhaps some of the basis around the thinking around liquid democracy? Yeah, liquid democracy is, is um, uh, democracy that does, doesn't get hung up on things like majority voting and stuff. It's basically, uh, I think, reaching for the same thing. Uh, so same, the, same intentional. The, the decentralized decision-making is reaching toward the same thing, which is uh, we the people uh, ruling. Okay. One, one way to think about sociocracy is as a tool or as a social technology that solves problems of coordination. And here we are not only talking about coordinating work and activities, but coordinating through level of abstraction involvement from the level of the individual to the level where individuals create a higher level organism that kind of has its own life and consciousness. 
Yeah, I've, I've always looked at organizations as a, a method of facilitating people coming together and coordinating is another good word about this, um, to create value. And that always works when the people are aligned with common purpose, objectives, and interests. And it also relies upon a common framework. But what we've seen over time is that the majority of the collaborative frameworks that organizations are using today are either based on ad hoc kind of what emerges and kind of the foundation of the founders, um, or it's based on the limitations and opportunities presented by technology systems. Um, in what cases are you seeing uh, organizational leaders looking to, to get rid of that kind of mess of just what happened and be more intentional, intentional about coming to look at something like sociocracy to help govern the business as opposed to govern, you know, the neighborhood or broader elements of society. I can uh, relate to a large commercial chain. I'll try, I'm trying not to say the Understood. name of it. Yes. Um, that, that I was uh, uh, asked to make a presentation at one time. This, this is a company with thousands, tens of thousands of people. And um, it was more agile based. I was there uh, with my agile hat on. Um, but I noticed going into the cafeteria that they had a very nice statement about the, you know, the purpose of the organization. So later on that day, when I was doing my session, I said, you know, does anybody, can anybody tell me what was on the door to that cafeteria? And because nobody could. Mm. It's like it was nice vision, nice thing, but it wasn't real. And so I think that the, the alignment or alignment and purpose needs to uh, come from the bottom uh, rather than the, the vision of the founders. And if the founders start it, they need to find a way, which we can show you how to do sociocratically, um, as well as with other technologies like open space. It's a really powerful tool. Um, to, to, to articulate it together so that it's really ours and not something that, you know, hey, we got hired. And by the way, here's your belief system now that we hired you. One of the, uh, one of the things that hit me early, I was very fortunate to uh, learn some facilitation through the Burkana Institute and a few others over the years. And as I looked into that, one of the things that really struck me was that there are certain situations that call for a certain technique or technology or protocol and started trying to map to that. Is, is, have you actually been working on that sort of map? Because it seems that with the way that, and we'll talk more specifically about how sociocracy works later, but it, it just seems to me that um, you've got a great uh, model for decision-making. Um, do you turn to things like design thinking and some of these other, uh, you mentioned open space, these other technologies that you apply to different situations? And do you actually, through the process of how you're looking at this, uh, do you have a sort of map on which technologies to deploy for which sort of outcomes and situations? Monica, do you want to? Um, sure. This, this is a very complex question, actually. When it comes to facilitating people, we are talking about regulating tension. And, and this tension manifests not only individual, in the individual, with what kind of anxieties am I showing up with? What kind of needs and outcomes am I pushing for? But it also manifests in the group between individuals. So within and between. And there are depending on what shows up in a group dynamic we are using different technologies we mentioned imago design thinking um, it very much depends on what is the problem that we are addressing are we addressing um, let's say creative problem solving that's the process that we need are we addressing tension that happens within the individual between the individuals um, when you ask for a map, I'm thinking of, do we have a list of this process for that? And my, uh, in my work, I tend to kind of integrate them um, in a way that it's simplified and doesn't necessarily pull out the individual processes. Um, but John, I want to invite you to add anything else to this. Yeah. The... Um, in the um, um, company-wide agility with 
Beyond Budgeting, Open Space and, and the Sociocracy book, the, we, the acronym is Bossa Nova. Um, the, we talk about a lot of theoretical frameworks in the first two thirds of the book. And then in the last third of the book, we say, the reason all those are useful is that really we're dealing with a, in a complex world and we have to be probing and experimenting all the time. And that is what we, how we discover what we wanna do. And these frameworks can suggest your hypothesis. We encourage everybody to do uh, something that Ralph Stacy, who's a big complexity theorist calls reflexive inquiry, which is thinking about how you are thinking. What framework am I bringing to this problem or situation that's actually limiting me? What are some suggestions from other things like, oh, is that really true? And being very disciplined about them probing in, into that and checking. So to say that, oh, we are going to come with a bag of tools and this is what you use is against the spirit of how you deal with complexity. Deep stuff. Um, and I got a lot, we could spend an hour just talking about this, but I've got a lot of other things to talk to you about, including getting into some techniques and some other elements of this. But I'm, I'm looking at it again from the perspective of, of like adoption. So one of the things, and we talked about this a little before we started recording, uh, that people tend to have resistance to, and that you've kind of just addressed, is the, the resistance to dogma of doing it this particular way. And as we looked at holacracy and watching that be implemented, um, a lot of my friends who were advising and implementing holacracy, they didn't implement full holacracy. Uh, they didn't go in with the regimen of the orange and teal and all these different levels and all that other stuff. I believe probably for the same reason, because we're dealing with the humanity side of it and the, the human psychology isn't always fitting into perfect boxes and able to do this stuff. And it also resists trying to be constrained in that way. Um, and so I, I guess what I'm leading to here uh, as we get to that, um, when we're out advancing sociocracy right now, are you advancing the idea of full adoption, trial adoption? How are you getting people into sociocracy and suggesting for them to look at trialing this or using it within their organizations? Do you want me to take that and I'll flip it to you, Monica? Okay, so first of all, uh, it's there's an interesting history on the holacracy uh, Brian Robertson was a, a, a client of mine at one point, and, and the first year after that was writing about sociocracy, and then he started off on holacracy. I was going, wow, great, he's trying something new. Um, the, I have lots of really good uh, learning relationships with things like Circle Forward and uh, Sociocracy for All and, and um, uh, uh, Sociocracy 3.0 and all that. We, we, you know, we trade thoughts and we're learning together. Um, the, I, I regret that that's not happened with the holacracy growth. There's not been a develop, you know, supportive development in that. Um, but um, yeah, it all goes back to Gerard Endenberg out in, in Rotterdam, who is like, uh, um, it's kind of the genius, a super genius that, that uh, came up with all the, these engineering ideas that also fit with people. And so Monica, you might want to say more about that or um, you know, please take it from there. Yes, I, I like to think of the elements or aspects of sociocracy as functions that are necessary to create something that is greater than the sum of us, that is kind of truly alive. And when it comes to implementation, it's a kind of thing that if you are an alive organism, you need those functions. You may choose not to uh, take them all or not at the same time. But let's say you want to play it safe and want to just experiment with consent decision making because that's making sense to you. Once you got that in place and it's working, you're going to realize that, oh, we need this other thing in place and this other thing in place. So whether you want to start with the whole or whether you're going to start from the bottom, if the processes and the structures that you have in place are coherent and sustainable, the other functions will be drawn into your um, scope of operations. 
Gotcha. So, um, I, uh, well, first of all, I, uh, I've got more to talk to you about about alive now because we, we believe <laughs> that organizations are organisms and it's a group of people and, you know, organizations are people, right, and all that other stuff. Um, so now I understand more about alive and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But um, this idea of being in, well, of having that presence and bringing to bear uh, w whatever it is that we can is, is really admirable. And, but what I'm really still looking at is the idea of if, are people coming to you right now and going, tell me about the principles of sociocracy? Or are they asking about how might I implement sociocracy as a system in my organization? And particularly looking at what's been happening in the last six months to a year since the pandemic and more people have been folks, you know, sent distributed back to their homes, working from home and other things. What are people in the market looking for when they come to you now? How to be connected, how to be both completely decentralized and out there, but also be connected and work together. And um, the the very few people, well, I would say some people come having thought about it a lot and they hear about this, the, this technology, sociocracy and, and beyond budgeting and all that, and they go, click, this is what I've been looking for. Other people will say, you know, we, we're having trouble with meetings and we you know, talk and talk and talk. And, and so it just depends upon what's, what's real for that person. Monica, you got more to add? Um, well, one exciting um, area right now is uh, the blockchain community that is experimenting with building decentralized governance into their technology and apps. And in order to do that, one needs to have an experience of what that is kind of human to human before you create or, or build it into something. So a lot of questions about um, how do we make decisions better than majority vote? Um, how can we be more effective, more alive in our organization? How can we integrate the human factor um, into our processes are the type of questions that lead people to us? Good. I have a, a, third, a third thought on that, Please. if I can. And that is that really, I think working remotely Bring, brings up the situation, how do I both work remotely and work together? And so it's not either or, it's how do we do both? And that takes us a, a, a new you know, process and ceremony and technology and, and, and you know, techniques that are not necessarily right at our hands right now. We've got to develop them. Yeah, and you know this does really hit at the the core problems that uh, organizations are facing now as they deal with this new remote work environment is the loss of social connectivity between the teammates that they previously had from shared space and shared experiences, and how to reproduce that and ensure that they have um, that real sense of teaming. And that's been a, a top issue that we've been working on. There's a whole bunch of new technologies emerging around it, um, but it's still my belief, and this is why I believe Jess ended up finding me or however you guys found me that um, we need to be more intentional about how we actually collaborate yeah. together. And I'm, 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 I want to come into um, one other point before I, I, I start moving into kind of some of the basics, um, which is that, uh, well, actually, I guess, I guess the thing is that I'm really looking at here is um, when Actually, let's let's forget that thought because you know what? <laughs> That's going to end up in a different way. Let's move back into the core stuff. I'm so sorry that, that we really need to talk about, um, which is coming back to this idea of being alive um, and organizations being alive. Um, what, what is governance alive? Tell me more about the name and, and assumingly this is idea of being a live organism as an organization, but what is governance alive and why did I get it wrong when I first looked at it? Yeah. The, uh, um... To, when I really started trying to, to bring sociocracy was what it originally was uh, into the, the US, uh, I faced a very big marketing problem. The word sociocracy sounded like socialism, sounded like communism. And, you know, what are you, you know, you're, what are you going to do, you know, try to pull my country down? Um, and the word governance um, had this, I, I call it the G word. It's like, oh, my God, governance, how boring is that? And so it's like, 
what I was doing is like, you know, it's kind of like Smuckers, you know, if, if a name like that, it had to be good. And um, so we came up with the name Governance Alive because we were trying to get across. It's like, hey, you know, we need to be interacting in ways together that we really feel alive. We, you know, I, I, I like the analogy with an, an octopus with, you know, it's an animal with, with nine different brains and they're all independent brains, but they're, you know, they're working together. It's like, how can we, how can we really work well together and be alive? How can we be, be simulating a live organism so that it's exciting and it feels good? And, and yeah, we got to do that governance stuff to get there. So it's a, it's a both end synthesis, boring word and, and happy word. <laughs> Um, Monica actually, has, give, yeah, Monica, go ahead, Monica, Monica please. More about that. Yeah, yeah. In addition to integrating the kind of both end of kind of governance, regimented, structured, organized, alive, kind of chaotic, we'll find a way no matter what. Um, we are also intending to um, take inspiration from nature and from life. Uh, John mentioned the octopus, which has the benefit of nine brains. And it's the evolutionary example of how uh, different individuals uh, can be brought together. The, the octopus's brains are not networked in a command and control way, but through a, uh, in a way that we call facilitative integration. Another inspiration that we draw from that's alive is something called the slime mold, which is an amoeba that can very well survive in nature by itself and forage. But when many of these uh, microcellular organisms come together as a whole, they can accomplish incredible things. Experiments have shown that they can learn, um, they, um, make decisions together very efficiently, um, it's, it's fascinating. So alive to us is also about kind of let's learn from life, basically. Cool. Um, I want to come back to the, the, to the boring side of that word with the governance <laughs> stuff. In fact, and that's where I was trying to go before, and I ended up on like trying to bring four thoughts together that I wasn't able to do. So <laughs> let me focus on the one element of it, which is that most team leaders or people, particularly in larger organizations, think governance is something that happens with the board and the C-suite. So they're not thinking about governance, they're thinking about collaboration. And of course, governance requires collaboration as part of a decision making and activation and all that other stuff. So, but, but the language that they use is the language of collaboration, not the language of governance per se. Um, to what extent are people getting that you're really talking about how we work together and to what extent is commercial entities as opposed to government, nonprofit, societal efforts um, starting to embrace sociocracy? Hmm. That was several questions there. Like I said, I was trying to avoid <laughs> doing it choice. before, but <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. The, I would say that we have proof if you look at the pandemic that we are being ruled by very phlegmatic, slow to move systems yes. in a normal way. I mean, like there were a lot of people saying, you know, I would like to work from home three days a week, not just this one day a week that you, I get to do every other month and it will work. And they were poking at the system and it's like, you know, I don't know, you know, we have all these concerns and worries. And then the pandemic hit and everybody was working from home. And so why couldn't that ability to work from home and all the advantages that come from that penetrate this megalithic system? And the, if we, you know, we don't, don't ever waste a good crisis. What we see is that we now see just how really unresponsive, unagile these corporations are, these big organizations. Why does that have to be? An elephant is a pretty agile animal. It doesn't have to be, you know, like a, like you know, just a, a, a pile of clay or something. And so, there, there's a interaction that needs to happen that gets the these big structures so that they can actually respond to the the, the citizenry that's working for them. And and so it it although we want to work from home, 
um, we, we still are working in a lot of cases for big corporations and the big corporations are like you poke them and it's like a bowl of jello, they don't go anywhere. So the sociocracy, it's important to be able to work together on your team or you know, the, your work group, or you've got a new company going and you know, do all that kind of work together. But it's also important to say to the big systems of society, it's like, hey, you know, there's a problem here. And it's really clear that you don't know what you're doing when it comes to listening to the people that, that are working together as part of that system. And uh, so that's the bigger challenge that we face that it's become really clear. And I don't know if I answered any of your questions, maybe one of them, Monica, you take did. it. <laughs> Um, and obviously, unfortunately, there are definitely examples in, in Netherlands, there is a city that has um, adopted sociocracy, for example, um, introducing this from the governments into the more social level of interaction. Um, but really, what we are talking about when it comes to governance, we are talking about um, decision making and whose decision counts. And when it comes to whose decision counts, we are talking about power. Switching governance systems means rewiring power. And that's quite an endeavor. Um, existing power systems will show resistance to new ways of working unless it is introduced um, gradually and in the way that helps them recognize that what you're happening here is not loss of power, but gaining power by allowing more mm. voices to provide feedback into the system. Well, that's still scary for all those people who are based in a controlling mindset. Uh, and so the, the resistance is still deep in some organizations, unfortunately. What I've seen over the years is that, you know, when presented with opportunities to improve, people, uh, leaders inside these larger organizations with certain responsibilities are less motivated by opportunities of improvement um, than they are for solutions to crises. <laughs> and that when things are painful is when they're willing to look at and consider, okay, how do we do this? Um, and so that's why I think this moment that we're in right now is a really ripe opportunity to look at sociocracy, but it's important to point out, I think right now to anyone listening that um, sociocracy isn't this whole big thing. Sociocracy is really this method of gaining uh, consent and including the voices of all the different people. And then you're talking about other things like an agile approach. We're talking about uh, beyond budgeting, which we can talk about later. And we're talking about uh, some of these other principles and, and methods and social technologies that we apply. So in many ways, what you've been talking about so far isn't just sociocracy, but it's about the social technologies that we can use for optimizing our ability to create value together and do it in such a way that every individual's humanity is respected. Um, is that, am I getting that right? And to yes. what extent, yeah. how would you reflect back kind of what I said in, in your terminology? In terms of the deeper purpose of like how sociocracy fits in this broader work. Because to me, it seems like just one tool or one arrow in your quiver now of this broader set of tools that you have, correct? Um, absolutely. And I really, really like what you said in the beginning about uh, whether the motivation for changing systems is to grow and develop curiosity, excitement, or whether it's a crisis and systems are, are forced uh, to change. And one thing that I'm excited about around sociocracy is that, yes, it does bring consent uh, to the table, but it brings it in a, in a very exciting way. It um, I'm, I'm, um, I'm losing my words right now, but it, okay. it helps, helps a system uh, do that feed forward of like, how, how can we grow? How can we improve? As opposed to, um, there is this foresight that it's built into when we use consent uh, from people and a diversity of perspectives. So that got a little bit away from me, John, is there? Something that no, the, the, um, if I may just phrase it a little more tighter, because I think I can do that. Um, sociocracy, it seems, is one tool of many 
in this broader effort of change management to unleash the power and potential of our humanity uh, in working together in organizations. Do you, do you have another way when you're looking at the whole of your work that you reference it? Or is it that sociocracy has become sort of the tip of the spear or the umbrella through which you talk about all these different disciplines and technologies yeah. you're bringing to bear? So, sociocracy does have some unique um, aspects to it, like the, the double linking um, and the, uh, the consent decision making. Those are really, really like sparklingly new things that Endenberg came up with. Um, and so it's, it's the thing that um, um, I think makes the biggest difference the quickest when you start doing it. Um, and so, um, but sometimes it's better to come in from an agile standpoint, or maybe a, a large number of people need to make a decision together. So you roll in the open space conference techniques as, as, as well as trying to build them into the way people are, are working every day, you know, like advice process and all that kind of stuff. Everything's, if you're looking at it in spiral dynamics, we're trying to get beyond teal to turquoise. And um, so there's all that in there, but back really practical. So with, with, with the um, experience with COVID, if you're in a big organization, you can have a conversation with whoever you're able to get to in your management hierarchy and say, hey, we were trying to get to work from home and you wouldn't listen to us until you had to. And there's a bunch of other things that we have to say and you're not listening. Mm. Now let's be methodical about this and work together so that our voices really can get there because you were missing a lot of smarts that we have and so and you're not structured to do that and so that can be a start of a conversation and you know there's a bag of tools out there and let's let, you know let's start the process we can start just with our team let's start some experiments um it can be as as radical as uh let's everybody say what their salary is none of this secret stuff and what happens and there are corporations that have done that and they end up totally changing their their um a remuneration system and the way they you know people get together and they they make decisions about all right you you get this kind of raise this year we all agree and there's, so there's all sorts of things that you can do just by saying how about you practice with us now to do some experiments because you screwed it up before the company screwed it up that you wouldn't listen to us let's try some listening to us experiments and it's not just us but we need you the manager in here thinking with us together that's kind of the spirit of sociocracy. It's the spirit of beyond budgeting. It's the spirit of agile. It's that's the, the fundamental spirit is, you know, you're, you're hung up on, you got to tell us what to do. There's also another loop that goes up that gives you feedback and we need to be working together. The, um, you know, when I was talking to Doug Kirkpatrick a couple of weeks ago, he reminded me again, about, there's so many elements to a lot of these things. And again, going from 30,000 30, miles, let alone 30,000 feet down to interpersonal, right? Um, but he talked about the idea that uh, we, uh, non-coercion, right? That it, it's about, and that to me gets to consent and a lot of other things like this. But a number of years ago, I built an application uh, that was based on the idea of asking, not tasking. And I didn't have the word consent in my vocabulary when yeah. thinking about this at the time, but it's a, a similar sort of principles, which is why I was so excited about learning of your work. Um, and so I, I think that there is this greater set of energy brought to an organization, but and, and it can come from the bottom up, and that's going to be your new book is somewhat, and it comes from the top down. I think it needs to come from both, right? Yes, when, to absolutely. really make it work it's, effectively. It's both end. Mm -hmm. And so uh, how does um, somebody who's listening right now, um, who just, you know, whatever, they're in the middle of the organization, they're, they're maybe have a few people on their team, they report to a few other teams, you know, so they're in one of those kind of positions in the organization uh, as part of the tentacles out there. Um, how does somebody like that go about introducing sociocracy in some of these concepts what might they do practically to go i think this is a greater idea because right now uh with everyone working remotely and the way we're running meetings and you know by the time we're finished with everyone saying hello and getting started half the meeting time's over and we've got 30 minutes left to get our decisions made and, and get our work done um 
you know, how does somebody who's suffering through that inside the organization, a potential change agent, go about introducing sociocracy into their organization? Um, there are many ways to go about it, depending on whether um, we are doing a, a full implementation or, or just the bits and pieces model. And by full implementation, I don't mean the whole organization, but one team is going to try out the principles um, and then do measure whether, you know, have these principles improved us or didn't, didn't improve us. Um, in that way, one thing about sociocracy is that there is a learning curve. It requires a paradigm shift for how we work, operate, and behave with each other. So training is helpful if you do what we call a pilot implementation in, in one team. However, if somebody has received some sociocratic training and is familiar, very simple steps like uh, making sure that a meeting has an agenda and people are clear what they're going to talk about making clear that the group understands how they make decisions, be that majority vote, be that consent, but we know the decision has been reached and not that the conversation goes on and people make assumptions about what the group has decided. Um, are the kind of more obvious and, and simple steps to do that. Is there something else that you would wanna add, John? Um, yeah. Um, the, the, it depends upon the organization, of course, but um, we've got some resources on our website. Uh, we've actually even got uh, some uh, beta software that helps automate uh, support for meetings like, you know, uh, timers and, and uh, minutes and access to documents and all that. So that you could introduce that. Um, and the, the meeting aspect is is um, uh, one one of the simplest ways to get into things that also have structural components now there is a very important distinction between when a group is making a decision about policy together you know how we're going to work together and how it makes a decision about operations and well, there's a lot of people out there that are like saying okay we're a, a group of eight or nine people we're starting a company we have a, a co-op or something and we want no managers. And that can cause problems. If you're not clear about when you're making decisions together for policy purposes, where you really need everybody's voice there by consent, and other ones where, hey, we just want to get something done, we're actually going to give one of us the power to be the boss today, or this week, or on that topic. And the boss then says, okay, I'm going to maybe listen to what you have to say, but my, you know, what I say goes, and we just go off and we do what I said. And, and that, that, that ability to say, we want you to lead us in this task we have is very empowering and gets things going much quicker, but you can pull it back then. The a little known fact is that until 1850s, the men in the US Army elected their officers. They said, we want to say who will lead us into battle. And that disappeared in the, all the trauma of the Civil War and the big corporations coming in. But that's still very much in the American spirit is we want to elect our leaders. We need leaders, but we want to be in charge of who they are. So making that distinction between, oh, we all have to be together kind of like a legislature and make decisions about our policies or, hey, let's get things done. You lead us. That dynamic and trying to experiment with that dynamic can make a huge difference in terms of the efficiency of the way you're operating. Yeah, and, and you, you hit upon this here is I, I think in uh, in some of the pre-reads as I was looking at this. Well, first of all, we, we haven't even really explained how sociocracy works. So I, I want you to do that in a minute here. But it okay. seems to me that um, applying like the core principles for how we get to a decision in terms of facilitating the conversation is really you know, at, at the kind of heart of this work, because it requires that mutual respect for everyone 
in the team in the room who, who matters in the decision whether however that team has been formed which is a, another issue that's addressed elsewhere in sociocracy and the approach is is also very important because that needs to be done intentionally and to ensure we're not leaving anyone out um but uh, anyways why, why don't we just go and, and if you could just talk through kind of how um, decision making works inside sociocracy and how and then I think from describing that people will see how it might be able to help them run their remote meetings more effectively. Sure. You want to take that Monica? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Jeff. All right. Um, so um, there's there's a number of different kinds of meetings. The two basic ones are meetings what we call circle meetings where you get together periodically. And, and decide how you're, you're uh, going to be operating differently uh, or what you've learned and that kind of thing. And then there's meetings that are operational meetings. If you're talking agile, you can roughly say that like the daily stand-up meeting is an operations meeting. And it, uh, uh, the um, uh, retrospective and then your planning meetings are more policy meetings because you're deciding together what you're going to do. Um, in agile, um, the... Um, stand-up meetings don't have a particular boss, but they do have the scrum master who goes off and, and makes sure things are happening. And so that's a different way of doing it. Um, if you have somebody who's in charge of the server, that person is in charge. So they're actually an operations leader. So there's these different roles with different ways power is configured. The, the new thing about sociocracy is that which enables the voice from below to come up and that's the circle meeting because it has everybody together. The, literally, the operations leader, if you have one, becomes completely equivalent to everybody else because everybody can, can raise an objection. And so that's really important. And you're, it's a both end thing. You're flipping between everybody. It's completely equal. And we are going to organize however that is, other than that, to get things done during the day. And that's very often a, 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 you know, a, a traditional hierarchy. It doesn't have to be. Um, and so it's true that there are no managers and there are managers. It's a both end kind of a thing, it's just depending upon which time of the day it is. Um, and so how does that work remotely? The Weaver software that I mentioned is really helpful when you're operating, you know, having a meeting uh, on, on, online. There are some really simple things that you can do just to experiment with this stuff, like having a facilitator, somebody who's you know, running the meeting, who knows what the agenda is, and leads people in a round. And that means that you, you look and see if, if I, I don't like to do it on the Zoom screen so much because the pictures hop around. I usually make them just a list of people, work off the participants list or whatever, but even that hops around. But you go to each person and you make sure that they get a chance to say what they think about the topic that's up there. And that works magic because in a lot of meetings, it's the loud voices that come in there and they're hop, you know, <laughs> fighting for the floor. And the quiet voice is like, you know, I really have something to say, but you won't let me in. But, but if, you, if you make sure that everybody is equivalent and speaks about the same amount of time, then you end up with a much more efficient team. That's actually backed up by, by research. Like mm -hmm. Google's Project Aristotle says, two factors make a good meeting. There's good emotional intelligence. You're, you're like paying attention to each other and everybody talks about the same amount of time. And those are the only two things that correlate with good meetings. So you can, there's many different ways to to make sure everybody talks about the same amount of time. But if you've got somebody there who's really enforcing that, then it's just gonna go better. And those are two simple things that you can do. That's, uh, that's awesome. And it is something that more people need to do um, in, on many different levels. Um, I'm wondering as we start looking at this, so again, as we start talking about decision-making about the management of conflict inside of this, uh, I actually have been working with a conflict styles assessment uh, that we've developed that with my friends at Rally Bright. Um, it's based on family theory, so it's probably based on similar stuff that what you've done relative to peacekeepers, problem solvers, et cetera, and these different personalities or characteristics that people will bring into conflict relative to their typical behaviors, right? Um, and you mentioned conflict before as an area of study, Monica, and, and what you've been doing. Um, and I think that's really still one of the core problems, particularly here in the US, that people haven't been taught how to actually have constructive conflict 
and to have self-awareness to understand their emotions and to be able to communicate uh, where their feelings are. So that's led us to actually a focus on a need for people to invest more in knowing thyself or knowing themselves. Um, to what extent are you uh, relying on that sort of self-actualization or achievement of understanding of oneself in order to create a successful implementation of sociocracy. Because as I've seen it over the years, there's there's a sort of a bell curve distribution, if you will, of people who have attained some really deep sense of self-awareness and a small number who have none and the majority who are somewhere in the middle. Uh, and it seems like this sort of sociocracy model is relying upon bringing more people into that sort of higher EQ and, and self-awareness to work. Um, is that true or have you found the opposite to be true? Monica, this is your territory, big time. <laughs> <laughs> one, this is one reason why I love sociocracy and consent decision-making because over time, inevitably, the use of the tool will increase the emotional intelligence of the individuals engaging with it and the group overall. Um, the sociocratic, a lot of people use the words consent and consensus interchangeably. In sociocracy, we have a very particular mechanism for making consent decisions, and that's by surfacing paramount objections. In effect, asking for conflict mm. of why is this not working for you? What pitfalls do you see? How do you see this failing? In and when we make objections, it's very important to differentiate them from personal preferences. And in sociocracy, the way we can tell whether something is a personal preference um, versus an objection is that objections have to be reasoned, kind of just no, I don't like it, this doesn't work for me, it's not an objection. To make it an objection, you need to tell us why, what about this doesn't work? Um, what exactly do you not like about it or doesn't sit well with you about it? And in addition to reasoning it, connecting it to the aim of the group. If this is the goal that we have set for ourselves, then tell us how this reason connects with our ability to fulfill or not fulfill that goal. Um, that way we unclog a lot of group dynamics that get stuck into kind of whose opinion are we going with on this one. And, and the, the one other thing about it is an objection is not just the reasons, it's your emotion. So if I'm facilitating and I'm going around in a group and uh, uh, one person in the group uh, says, oh, no, no objection, I, I consent, and he's sort of looking down at it, or her, she's looking down at her belly button, then I will um, immediately say, that looks like an objection to me. And, and, so um, and, and uh, because the mouth is saying one thing and the body is saying something else, and we try to do whole person uh, uh, assessment of, of what's going on, then that's, that's really critical. It's like, watch your body. The, um, in, in Dutch, the word for uh, objection is but spar. Spar means heavy, and it really means I feel made heavy. In English, objection is like emotionally neutral, but the, the real essence is like, you know, it's a, this is, doesn't feel right. And, and so that's how we use the human factor, the human element to build emotional intelligence, because we look at um, the discrepancies between what we say and what we do and point them out. And the more they get pointed out, we become aware, the more we practice them, the more aligned we become both as an individual and as a group. You're muted, I think. Thank you so very much. I did. Uh, I was typing and I didn't want you to hear all my typing. Thank you. Um, so I love what you're doing uh, with all this and, and I'm a big supporter, but I, I, I continue to look at some of the resistance that I've seen to some of these principles over the years. And the one that really hits me right now as I'm listening to this is the amount of effort it's going to require to implement. It seems like, and really to the bottom line of it, uh, people have been going so fast 
that they don't want to slow down to do this. In fact, in times past where I've even tried to establish, okay, here's how I'm going to collaborate with a new client or what have you, um, they didn't even want to have that meeting and have that discussion about where were we going to talk, where were we going, to, what formats were we going to use, everything else. So, to what extent um, does this take more time, or how does it save time ultimately? Mm -hmm. um, the so if, if you've ever been in an athletic team where you're in the flow, it's like, you know, you're just, it's just like, it's, it's sort of magic. You're, you're working along, you hit top level performance and you don't get there without something that builds energy. And you don't, and, and one of the measurements of a successful meeting is people feel more energetic than at the end mm -hmm. than they did at the beginning. And so um, the, um, that, and I could go off on all kinds of branches from that, but that the having a, a team that feels energized makes all the difference in terms of the performance and the agility and the nimbleness of uh, handling, you know, unusual situations and taking advantage of opportunities. So what it what it comes down to as I, as I listen to that is that there's a fundamental change in the nature of an individual and a team's energy as a result of this, which is such a net positive beyond that it transcends the effort to get to that place or that it's much greater than the effort and investment of energy that it takes to get there. Is, is that essentially what you're saying? Right. Monica, and then I have a just thought on that too. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think that this, you're, you're kind of nailing this governance does cost. It costs time and it costs effort. Um, and the best analogy that I can use is the, the nervous system and the human body. There is the, what they call the sympathetic side of the nervous system. That's about go energy, uh, movement forward, productivity. And then there is the parasympathetic side of the nervous system that's all about rest, uh, repair, and the body would not function if we were only with the go, go, go. And so the governance piece is pretty much the rest repair function of a human. So think about what kind of world are we creating if the way we live our lives is kind of go, 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 caffeine, sleep does not important because I got to get this done. Is that going to be a healthy, balanced future? And so when it comes to governance, yes, the energy is about slowing down, reflecting, repairing what we've been doing in operations. And we may say, oh, I don't have time for that. Well, that's okay. But then on the long term, not only are you not going to be as effective, as productive, live as long, as if you did take the time to slow down for the governance piece. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I can tell a story about a um, school at a university that I worked with. And I won't say the university because I will say that a lot of the university was in a mess. Um, this um, um, school, because it had several departments, um, uh, were also in a mess, but they brought us in and we worked with them and magic began to happen. They started, uh, they added a few departments, they doubled the number of students all, while the rest of the university was going down. And so it was well worth the investment they'd made. It's kind of like when you bring in computers, it takes an upfront investment. When you, when you build anything, it takes an upfront investment. But with that built, they were getting, you know, uh, great big grants and all sorts of stuff that had not happened before that. And that the, I can point to lots of different examples where they made the investment, they did it right, and like, you know, magic happened. And yeah. the, you, another example from a big corporate standpoint is that corporation successes tend to be dependent upon a really innovative, excellent CEO. And what happens when that CEO goes away, you have things like the Kodak camera disaster. They, you know, they, they got run by the technology. Uh, they didn't listen to their workers. Uh, what about 
Kmart or Sears, and you can list this long list of really, apparently G General Motors got to be rescued by the US government. And so if you're investing in really top managers and not worrying about having the wisdom of the people, you're gonna go up and down. If you've got the innovation coming from the people, you're gonna be much steadier, much more innovative, and you're not gonna have the ups and downs of like, oh my God, we got that CEO in. I could point to another couple of big companies, like 100,000 people companies that just have been through that cycle. And so if you want to make a real, an investment that will pay off for a long time, then, then bring in the voice of the people. And I just want to add that there is this concept of go slow to go fast. And John, I really enjoyed your work with the university where they have decided that nobody is allowed to take homework after 5 p.m. <laughs> And the result, kind of instead of being less productive, they ended up being more productive and efficient. But they had to deal with that, you know, by saying, this is not working, what do we do? And so they, they changed their rules. Yeah. I have about uh, 30 other topics to bring up, and we didn't even get into group intelligence, team intelligence to the level that I want, <laughs> because that's a whole nother area for a whole nother couple of hours. But as we're running out of time here, I wanted to talk a little bit more and just close out in the last couple of minutes about governance alive and about how people engage you. Uh, and of course, where to find you, governancealive.com. That, that's fairly straightforward. But if I'm interested in exploring more sociocracy, how would I go about engaging you? And what sort of services would you provide? Um, we are currently offering uh, free webinars and uh, trainings and certification for sociocratic facilitators as a profession and sociocratic consultants. Um, John has uh, two books out there, uh, Bossa Nova, which is about company-wide agility with beyond budgeting, open source and sociocracy. And We the People is his book that describes socioc the, the principles and their implementation currently. And um, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it, you can also just get hold of us at contact. If you just want to talk, we can talk to you. So the, the, yeah. those are all different ways to do it. And there are free resources on our website. The article of creative forces of self-organization will give people a sense of what this is without reading the whole book. And so when you are your clients typically senior leadership or are you starting to see some people, you know, from the, the rank and file, so to speak, starting to reach out to you and trying to figure out? It's all over the place. It's really unpredictable. It's amazing, but it's unpredictable as to who who we start with. But one of the great things about this era now is, of course, that everyone is a leader in some capacity. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of whether or not they realize it. And more people are waking up to that opportunity. That's why they're becoming change agents. That's why they're introducing concepts like sociocracy and others into their organizations and trying to find ways to trial it. I think just the simple idea, as you laid out earlier, of doing these conversation rounds and making sure that everybody in the meeting has had a chance to uh, give their input is really important. And then I can't emphasize enough, coming back to Monica, what you were talking about earlier, um, the understanding of what's a personal preference versus an, a real objection. Um, and how do we actually take a more objective instead of subjective view on this? Because uh, some people I've seen in meetings just aren't able to see beyond their own personal preferences relative to technology choices and relative to how we communicate and what we do and how things should be. Um, and, and that's really, again, hard. That's why I think the self-awareness and EQ development and that is really important. But I'm really excited to see that it's not just about the sociocratic method as you're looking at, but it's about understanding these other tools like beyond budgeting, yeah. which we didn't even really get to talk about today, but which we will, I hope at yeah. some point in the near future. Any and, other closing thoughts yeah, before yeah, we Chris, get wrapped one, up here? Yeah, one quick closing thought is if you're wanting to start the conversation about these technologies in your organization, whether it's a co-op or whether it's you know like a highly structured corporation or whatever, the trick is do it with two people. If you just are bringing the idea up to the boss or to the rest of the group, it's like one person is like, what's wrong with you? But if it's two people, then you have much more credibility. So just that simple trick can make a big difference. 
Yeah. And, and try it and then notice the results and find a way to measure the results. And if right. you can provide Absolutely. those measurable results, then you can prove to people that you have it. I understand right. we've got to have a hard stop right now. I'm really, really grateful that you've both been able to join us today. And let me let me try to do this right again. Monica Majeski. <laughs> Majeshi, <laughs> sorry, I will, I, I will get it eventually. It, it's also very important to um, try to show respect for each other in these ways as well, and find a way to honor somebody by learning to pronounce their name properly. So thank you for bearing with me as I learn, Monica. I appreciate it very much. And John Buck, I really appreciate it. Um, John Buck and Monica Majeshi from GovernantAlive. Uh, dot com. And uh, let's talk more about sociocracy beyond budgeting and all the different ways we can make remote work better uh, over the year ahead. And I look forward to continuing our conversation with you both. Uh, for thank those you for your work, Chris. Yep. It's been a well, pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Have a great day.